dreaming? Well, we heard yesterday, you know, um, uh, we're not in dream time, you know, we, we're real. Um, but this is something that everybody in this country sort of goes to, like we call Chupapa, Gomara, and there's other, other names for, uh, for our law. But the law of the dreaming, the law, Gomara in my language, is our ancient law that underpins the unity between our nations and peoples in Australia. And that's what I talked about earlier this morning, about that common law with the song lines, where we connect all them stories through ceremony, etc., and songs. The law of dreaming is of this land. So that's the international continental common law. That's the continental common law of this land. That's what I'm talking about. Our people connection to all things natural are regulated by our laws. Yeah? So we are governed by these laws of the creation. Aboriginal engagement and association with the natural world are all encompassing. So they, we're not separate from that. You know, we're not like the Christians, you know, that man died for the, for, for the sins of man, yeah, but the man has dominion over nature. Yeah? And so he didn't die for all the wrong things he'd done to nature. He only died for the sins that man did. And so, he, so Christianity separates themselves from nature and, and the man. And so all men are evil. And so he died to protect their sins. Okay. I know that's a cynical remark. I shouldn't do that. But, you know. um, the United Nations. In 1970, the United Nations passed a resolution, the principle of equal rights and self-determination of people. And this is what it says, the principle of, of sovereignty, equality of states, all states enjoy sovereign equality. They have equal rights and duties and are equal members of the international community, notwithstanding differences of, of an economic, social, political or other nature. In particular, sovereign equality includes the following elements. States are judicially equal. Now, if you read Mabo, Mabo, when Mabo said that Aboriginal law and uh, custom is now recognised, is now recognised by um, uh, by the common law. Um, there's a fellow want to come in, so can we let him in, someone, please? Um, so the states are judicially equal. Now, when Mabo when Mabo made the point, it said that Aboriginal law and culture is now recognised by the English common law. It also said that that Aboriginal law and custom is inalienable. So inalienable means that the High Court of Australia recognises our law and custom as the equal to that of the white man. Yeah? And no court in this country can change it. None. And so that's that equality of judicial um, standards. <coughs> Each state enjoys the rights to inherit uh, rights inherent in full sovereignty. So when we look at that full sovereignty aspect, um, so there's nothing here that pre prevents us from enjoying those rights. Each state has a duty to respect the personality of other states. So when we assert, when we do our Universal Declaration of the Rights of, Indi um, uh, Declarations of Independence, and we make our statements and we write away to the governments, they have a duty to respect our existence. They, have, they must do that. The territorial integrity and political independence of the state are inviolable. That is, they can't be taken away. Yeah, you cannot, they cannot interfere with that. They can't take it away. And so this territorial integrity, if you go back to the, um, uh, the UNDRIP, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, you'll find that there that they say that uh, the uh, international community and the state must recognise the territorial integrity of the state. I had conflicts with them in the United Nations when they were writing all of this because I didn't agree with this. But you see, when I sat down with some of the uh, Native American lawyers um, in both Canada and, and uh, the United States at the UN and talked with UN lawyers about this here, they said when you people, that is the indigenous people, the First Nations people, when we assert our independence as an interstatehood and want to mark that occasion by doing that, it's so important then that that state, that is the Crown, must recognise the territorial integrity of our sovereignty. Right? So it works two ways. So that doesn't say that we have to 
recognise the territorial integrity of our occupying state. It doesn't. So we, we can twist that and turn it around. Because these are the rights of Indigenous people. That's what we must understand. So each state has the right to freely choose and develop its own political, social, economic and cultural systems. Nobody can tell us what we should be doing. Nobody. Each state has the duty to comply with full, uh, comply fully and in good faith with its international obligations and to live in peace with other states. My mob, when we, we did all that universal declaration of independence and we did our unilateral declaration of independence and we sent all the stuff off to the Queen and we did, did our declaration, the second step we did was to notify the United Nations, uh, Secretary General and the President of the General Assembly and then we also then sent all our what we call accession documents and the accession documents are basically saying to us that our nation agrees to abide by the principles of international law and we accede to all these conventions, that is we agree with all these conventions and we agree to be bound by those conventions and we also then went one step further and we did an accession uh, document which places us under the rule of the International Criminal Court of Justice, right, the ICCJ. And so we, we, um, we acceded to that court and the rules of that court. And so these are things that, these are little intricate de details that have to be followed when you're talking about going into uh, becoming independent nation <coughs> uh, The Declaration Granting in the Independence of Colonial Countries and Peoples, this is an extract, December 1960, the Declaration of Granting Independence of Independence to Colonial Countries and Peoples states, recognising the passionate yearning for freedom in all dependent peoples and the, the uh, decisive role of such people in the attainment of their independence, recognising that the peoples of the world ardently desire an end to colonialism in all its manifestations. So, this is what gives us the right to free ourselves from all of this. This is where it is, and this is what we, where we gain the legal right to do what, we, what we're going out to do. And of course then the Declaration of Granting Independence also said, believing that the process of liberation is irresistible and irreversible, and that in order to avoid serious crisis, an end must be put to colonialism and all practices of segregation and discrimination associated therewith. Uh, welcome the emergence of recent years of large numbers of dependent territories into freedom and independence and recognition of increasing <coughs> power trends towards freedom in such territories which have not yet been gained. One of the things that they did when they first in, um, um, what was it, 19, when Gough Whitlam, uh, when was that? When Whitlam came to power, um, Papua New Guinea was still a dependent nation, so it was a colony of Australia, Papua New Guinea. And Gough Whitlam then changed that circumstances and he gave the total territorial and judicial powers back to the state, back to Papua New Guinea, and he decolonised Papua New Guinea from Australia. Um, they then proceeded then also uh, to decolonise uh, Numea, and they gave back uh, the people of Numea their independence. So these were dependent colonies of Australia at the time, and it wasn't until 1975 that Gough Whitlam processed, proceeded down the road to give them their independence and he decolonised them and gave them their powers. And that's why Indonesia. Nauru, rather, Nauru. Eh? And that's why Indonesians moved in and they. Yep, they now, part of, part of the problem with Irian Jaya, Irian Jaya was controlled by the Dutch, yeah, West Papua. It was a Dutch colony, the same as the Macassan Islands. Yeah. And uh, when the Dutch moved out of there to decolonise after the Second World War, uh, they, all the, all the uh, Macassans and the people from Irian Jaya who um, were part of the military forces of the Dutch, the Dutch packed all their families up. There were something like about 230,000 people all up, native people from Macassans and from Irian Jaya, and they took all them back to, to Holland and just left the people nothing. and the, Indonesian moved in and just took total control with guns and military and took over the country. That's how they did it. They're like a civil war now. Yeah, yeah, they're civil war. Every time they fly their flag somewhere, the Indonesian moves in and shoot them. So that's West... Like, West Papua. West yeah. Papua. Yeah. What happens when they take over, then they're going to start on that? 
Yeah, they, they just kill them. They just kill them. Yeah. All right. Um, and convinced that all peoples have an inalienable right to complete freedom and exercise their sovereignty and integrity in their own national territory. So these are the powers that we have, and the UN keeps telling us that we have these powers. Um, all right, next one. Okay, and again, solemn procl proclaims, uh, solemnly proclaims the necessity of bringing to a speedy end unconditional colonialism in all its form and manifestation. All right. Um, this one here is important, and to this end declares that this is this a decolonization thing. The, subjugate, the subjection of peoples to alien subjugation, domination and exploitation constitutes a denial of fundamental human rights. It is contrary to the Charter of the United Nations and is an impediment to the promotion of cooperation and world peace. All peoples have an inalienable right to complete freedom and the exercise of their sovereign rights and the integrity of their national territory. Um, if we look at native title today, and how it operates, native title takes all this away from us. Yeah? All of that is taken away from us under native title. And we'll talk about that later on. Right. All people have a right to self-determination. I'll go to the next one, we've been through that. Um, uh, here, inadequacy of political, economic, social or educational preparedness should never serve as a pretext for delaying independence. So, this is the key. Because they will say, oh, you're not ready yet, you haven't got your governance in place, you've got no economy, you've got no parliament house, you've got no administrative offices. This, that is not a reason for them to say we can't do what we want to do. Us blackfellas, we used to sit under trees, around trees, and in, around berry bushes in the shade, and we talk business. That's where we governed, right? So our parliament house don't need electricity, and our parliament house don't need electric lights and computers. <coughs> we know the rules. Okay. Um, all armed action of all repressive uh, measures of all kinds directed against independent peoples shall cease in order to enable them to exercise peacefully and freely their right to complete independence and the integrity of their national territory shall be respected. Now, this is an interesting statement because, you see, one of the brothers who came over to my place from your country, um, Jeffrey Stokes, you know, this black fellow was on his own country. He was telling me a story about when the police arrested him for discharging a firearm in a public place. And, um, and Jeffrey said to me, he said, now I want you to help me how to get out of this problem. And I looked at the, the punishment. Jeffrey could have went to jail for seven years for discharging a firearm. And he had to find a good excuse because in Western Australia, their laws are really strict when you read them. And they're not like common law, they are, they are French type laws where what's written is the law. And so, anyway, Jeffrey would stay, come over to my place and we were sitting down and talking about how to get him out of this case. So I told him what to do. And when the, where Jeffrey got in trouble was that he said he was going home and there was these blokes with these bulldozers, uh, front end loaders and bobcats, and they were, they were digging dirt, soil, from his country near a sacred place, he said, and I seen them. And they said, I asked them what they were doing, and they said, oh, none of your business, get away from here. He said, so I went to my gun, went to my car where I carried my shotgun, and he said, I pulled it out and I shot over their head and told them to get off my country. He said, they called the police, the police come and arrested him, charged him for discharging a firearm in a public place. But it wasn't a public place, it was on his own country. And so what we the argued, yeah, so we argued that the, that there was no one there, no harm was done. These people were occupying, they were trespassing on his country and that they, they had no right to be there. So it, it became a right of those miners to take, take the um, uh, rare earth that's on his country. And by the way, that rare earth that they were getting was so valuable that it was worth more than gold per ounce. Yeah? So one of them big containers makes them multi-millionaires. That's how valuable that stuff is. Yeah. Michael, do you happen to know how Australia voted on this General Assembly resolution? Yes, they voted in favour of it. Okay. Yeah, and there's no reservations okay. that we know of. Yeah. <coughs> so, so you can use that as well? Yes. So this here, this, this is where they, when we argue, they used excessive force. Yeah. 
they used this arm accident and excessive force by bringing the police out to stop him from exercising his rights, his legal rights, on his own country under his law. And so Geoffrey, Geoffrey ended up, it was a long, it went on for about two and a half years, but I think Geoffrey won that case. They, he, he, they just threw it out. Yeah. Um, and of course here, immediate steps shall be taken to trust and self-governing territories of all territories which have not yet attained independence to transfer all powers to the people of those territories without delay without any conditions and reservations in according with their freely expressed desires, without any distinct, uh, distinction as to race, creed, colour, or in order, and in order to enable them to enjoy complete independence and freedom. What I talked to you about yesterday was about up here in the Kimberley. What we've done there now, because the people own all that country now, um, we're exercising this, the power that's here. And so what we've done is we've set up I've worked with them up here at Wyndham, and what we're doing is we're setting up, we've set up a, um, a development corporation. The PBC body had taken us, taken them five years to get the people who shouldn't be on there, got nothing to do with their country, but they got rid of them now. It's taken us five years to get control of the PBC body, and the PB, PBC body yesterday met, and they were passing a resolution to transfer all power back to the Kimberley, uh, to that, um, what, what do they call it? The, the Sunset, the Sunset Development Corporation. Okay, and so now, now that the PBC body has relinquished all powers back to that development corporation, and they took control, they're now exercise. They will commence within the next twelve months to develop all their country, all that country, and it's the it's like I say, that country is the wealthiest place on earth. Okay? and so they're going to get into it now, and this year is what they will do. They will use this here now to begin to exercise their own right in this country. And the, their next step now will be to buy uniforms for security people to look after all their country and put their own police in power. They've already written to the government of Western Australia and told the Western Australian government that your police will no longer have any authority in our country. And you have to get permission to come onto our country from here on in. And so they're, they're making that move now and things are working in that direction. And we. We're pretty happy. I'm waiting for them to sort of... I'll, I'll probably fly up there in the next couple of weeks because now they've got this power and authority to do it. And so we now start making inroads into developing them so that they develop their own economy and we set up their parliamentary process and we set it all up. So all those things are starting to work. So it's part of this here. Um, now this one here is important. This is when I, when I was the head of the um, treaty unit here in Canberra. Um, for the National Aboriginal Conference. This is Minister Baum, and um, he was addressing this to the Prime uh, The Attorney General of Australia advised the Prime Minister Fraser on the 15th of July, 1980. And this is what Baum referred to uh, when he went to the Department of Aboriginal Affairs. And they were concerned because they said here, however, the Attorney General recently advised the Prime Minister in a letter dated 15th of July, 1980, that having regard to the connotations of the word treaty, in international context, it would be very desirable to avoid the word treaty in relation to the agreement and that instead a term such as makarata may be used if upon full examination it was found appropriate. So this is why when they went to that Uluru meeting up there, they all come up with the word makarata again. What does makarata mean? Makarata means to end a conflict between different people, blood has to be shed. It's blood trouble. has to be shared. Yeah, it's trouble, but proper way. Yeah? You've got to make blood got to flow. You've got to that's kill him. Yeah, that's 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 Yulgamo. Yeah, Yulgamo, and that goes to you know, um, Galawinka. They different mob. But the thing is, when I was down at Santa Teresa talking to him about this in 1983, and I was there, one old man stood up and he said, "Hey, mate, can you don't don't say Makarata here?" He said, "Because we know what Makarata means." And um, he said, we don't want that word. Because, you know, otherwise we have to go to war with the white fellas and someone has to die and bleed in order for us to come to this. And then after that, then we finish it. Okay? So that's black and white. And so this makarata should never be used as a word for treatment. This is Peter Bowen? This is Peter Bowen. Yeah. Okay. This one.
Um, he was a, a physician, by the way, a doctor. Doctor, yeah, Dr. Peter Barton. And then he said, I note that the resolution by the National Aboriginal Conference request a treaty of commitment between the Australian Government and the Aboriginal Nation. For the reasons mentioned above, the use of that word should be avoided at the Commonwealth, yeah, by the Commonwealth. And that word is treaty. Yeah. So this is, this is proper legal advice internally with the Prime Minister and the Attorney General of Australia and the Aboriginal Affairs Minister. So they knew what, the, what they were up against. They knew what was coming. Uh, Australian law of Commonwealth. Now, the, the Australian Commonwealth Government is an illegal occupying colonial power under international law and needs to be and needs to decolonise. Now, see that this here, occupying colonial power. If you go to the report uh, that was tabled to the Senate in 1983, uh, 83. Um, the report is called 200 Years Later. It's a Senate Committee on Constitution and Legal Affairs. And they went into the, um, they, they did the study about the word treaty and how they're going to deal with Aboriginal people. In that, report, in that report, you'll see where I made a submission, personal submission, and said that, um, you know, Aboriginal sovereignty existed at the time and that there was a set of rule of governance set in this place. And then I, I said to him that essentially you are an occupying power in this country. You don't have legitimacy, yeah? Because you never ever engage with the true people and engage them in some sort of process where you united them and they engaged to become a country with, with legal authority over governing this country. Anyway, in the report, the report then said, um, and I'm paraphrasing here, but I recall the, the report saying um, that um, it may be that when British sovereignty occurred, um, that at the same time um, sovereignty inured in the Aboriginal people. Yeah? And so that's the report to the Parliament. But then they go on and say that Australia um, is an occupying power, and that, um, uh, what was the next one? The, the, they were an occupying power, and that the Aboriginal law and customs were not recognised by the legal system, yeah? which gives us sovereignty. Now, that was 1983. Ten years later, or nine years later, 1992, where Mabo came out, and Mabo said that Aboriginal law and custom um, is recognised now by the common law. So when you take that and you go back nine years to that report, they said that, yes, sovereignty and heir to the Aboriginal people, but the common law don't recognise it. Now the common law recognises it, so we've overturned that, and we've now established that Aboriginal sovereignty does, does in fact, is a legal thing in this country. It's very real. It's not gambling. Yeah? Okay, sovereignty never ceded. Keep going. Um, now... When was this? 1999. 1999, um, as you can see, I was starting to get my gaps at this time. Um, returning the flag to, the, to England. This is in front of Buckingham Palace okay, in London. This flag, um, Ellie Gilbert lived tricked me. I had no idea what was coming. But anyway, I'd gone back, I'd gone to England for some other reason. And then this flag was brought from out of the desert, mm. brought for Kevin Buzzacott. He was taking it around to different mobs and they were singing that flag, singing all the badness out that the British brought with them through that flag. And so they were singing it and they were, they, and as you can see on this year, this is a spear that came out of the desert as well. And all the different tribes who sung it, all the different nations put their own little marks on it to send that bloody evil back to that place. Yeah? And so, anyway, so this shirt was wrapped up in, a, this flag was wrapped up in our shirt. Ellie said, here, put that in your bag. You're going to take that back with you. I said, well, I'll do it. And she said, you've got to give that back to the, to the Queen. I said, yeah, I'm going to do that. You know, you think I can guard it everywhere. Anyway, and then when I got to London, Ellie said, oh, there's going to be, there's another thing for you. You'll get a parcel, it'll arrive in London with you. 
when I got there, I got picked up by this fellow in one of them, you know them Jaguars, you know, they long little motor cars and only two people can sit in them like a racing car? And this fellow turned up in this car, put my bag in it, no room for me and him nearly, because they're only tiny little thing. But then this thing, this long table long, there's this big pipe, I'd walk around and bloke said, I think that there's yours, and I looked around and there's this big pipe, you know. And inside that pipe was that spear. So they packed it on there, he packed it on there, in my bloody name. Yeah. And there's this, this spear in it. So, <laughs> and it was good anyway, as you see, it became very useful. Yeah. So anyway, I did the business. I, I was singing, and I, had to, I know, the, know that business about giving it back. And then, um, um, this, is, this is about nine o'clock in the morning. It was three degrees. It was winter time, but you know when you're doing business, you don't feel much at all, you know. And then the the lawyer, this fellow here, he stopped from me from stripping down properly. Uh, he said, "No, no, you can't take the clothes off. You've got to." No, no. I said, "Well, this is proper way." And I said, "I don't care where I am." And they said, "No, no, no, no. Keep your trousers. Take everything off. Keep your trousers." So anyway, I did that, and um, and then all these people. So in Buckingham Palace, but Buckingham Palace became irrelevant. Then me, look, they wanted to know what I was doing. They were not interested in Buckingham Palace. So anyway, the police then all of a sudden I heard the band playing, music playing in the background. And then all of a sudden, all these policemen on horses come and pushed everybody back. And I thought, oh, did they nice, eh? Clearing all these people away from me. You know? And they pushed them all back behind the barrier then. Then that's the main gate of Buckingham Palace. Anyway, and then all of a sudden the policeman turned up. And this fellow here, with the bobby on, that fellow, he was a commissioner who was the security for all of the front of Buckingham Palace. And he came in and he asked me what I was doing, and I said, I'm doing business. Like they got no bloody idea what you say when you do bit when I say I'm doing business, I said, I'm doing business. So what they did then, these fellows, like this lawyer came across. And he said to the policeman, because the policeman said, can you stop? You can keep doing it. After we do all the parade and all the official stuff in <coughs> Buckingham Palace. And at that time, that's when I turned around. When they said that, then they asked me. And I actually turned around and ignored him. And this one, this barrister here, he went up to this bloke and he said, by the way, he said, there is no law in England that can stop this man from doing what he's doing. And everything that you want to do, all the parades have to stop because he's here doing something official in front of Buckingham Palace on that ground and he has every legal right and it overrides it. And because he's on Crown country, on the Crown's law, he has every power to do what he's doing and you can't stop him. So the policeman disappeared. I continued on with my business. When I finished, I got that flag on the end and I threw the spear straight across the Buckingham Palace gates and threw it into the yard. And then this fellow, he said, come on, put your clothes on quick. I said, what? He said, I'm going to see. He said, here's 500 pounds. Put it in my hand. He said, I've already got my mate over there waiting at um, Waterloo Station. He said, you're going to Paris for a couple of days. Get out of here. He said, just in case them fellas find a law that they can arrest you under. Yeah, so anyway, I ended, up, I ended up with a free ride over to Paris and run around with 500 pounds. And that's Queen Victoria's statue in front of Buckingham Palace. Yeah. And she was the woman who gave us the power, this woman here. So I took the power to her and then give this back and that's what happened. So it went all over the world, that, that little business, okay? And so here is where that woman, Queen Victoria, this is an order in council, by the way, a legal order in council that has never been taken away. And it says, nothing here in, in such order in council shall, um, um, Order in, council, uh, order in council, that is, order in council, shall extend or be construed to extend to invest Her Majesty, her heirs and successors, with any claim or title whatsoever to dominion, to dominion or sovereignty over any such islands or places, as aforesaid, as uh, can derogate from the rights of the tribes or peoples inhabited. Um, inhabited uh, 
uh, the islands or places of Teed, um, islands or places, or of the Teed or rulers thereof to such um, with their sovereignty or dominion, and, and a copy of every such order in council shall be issued, therefore, unless the parliament shall not be then be sitting, um, which case a copy shall be laid before each house of parliament within 30 days after the commencement of uh, the next parliament session. That's an order in council from being to Queen Victoria. Now that was, that there, when I went through this year book, the bills of memorandum from 1875, from the Parliament of England, that there, 1875 Act had to be read as one, not a separate act, but as one with the 1872 Act. And the 1872, 1872 Act said that, um, said that these people, um, this law applies to New South Wales, Queensland, West Australia, Victoria, Tasmania, New Zealand. No islands were mentioned in any of those acts. Right? They named those places. Okay? So, when people say this is the Pacific Islanders Act and it only relates to the people of the Pacific, bullshit. Not true. Because it says New Zealand, New South Wales, West Australia, Queensland. And so this law has never been taken away. Next one and then we'll finish for lunch. I think it's great. Yeah. Okay. So the next one. Pacific Islanders Act here. Um, where are we? Here. Definition, this is the 1872 Act. Definition of term term government shall include the office of time being administered in the government of any Australasian colonies and governor in the council shall mean the governor acting by and with the advice of the executive council of the colony under, the gov under his government. The term Australian colonies shall mean and include colonies of New South Wales, New Zealand, Queensland, South Australia, Tasmania, Victoria and Western Australia. So that law applies to every state in this country and it's never been taken away. Uh, Pacific Island Protection Act. This, I, I wanted to make sure that it was law in Australia. The only way it could become law in Australia was that it had to be gazetted in Australia on Australian soil. And here, a fellow by the name of His Excellency Sir Hercules, uh, George, um, someone, Robinson, Robin, that's a rat. <laughs> anyway, it looked like Robert. Robert. Uh, Robert Robinson. Yeah. Knight Proud Cross Most Distinguished Order of St. Michael and St. George, Governor and Commander in Chief of the Colony of New South Wales and its dependencies and Vice Admiral of the same. And that's where he proclaimed that law on Australian soil. So the Governor of the colony. Um, we're just about to break now. We're just about to break. Um, so, as you can see, they cannot say that it was, was not proclaimed and gazetted on Australian soil. He's the bloke that gazetted it. Yeah? And he's the bloke, by the way, that signed the deal when the Fijians ceded all their powers and country to England, uh, to the Crown in 1875. So this all at the same time. So what I'm saying is that that law, recognising our sovereignty, was never taken away and it was made legal on this soil by the monarch himself. And here, this is the um, a Government Gazette um, in London um, order. And so, uh, sorry, this is Australia. And they brought this act in the Kidnapping Act, Church of the Pacific Islanders. That's very much part of that whole gazette. <coughs> Next one. Uh, then, then here we come to this one. This is the British law. This is the British Parliament rescinding the last parts of the 1875 Act uh, and 1872 Act of Britain. Uh, that Pacific Island Act it says an act to promote and reform the statute 
uh, of the statute law by the repeal in accordance with the recommendations of the Law Commission and the Scottish Law Commission of certain enactments which, and this is the key, except insofar as their effect is preserved. Right? So the effect of the law is preserved. It's never been taken away. Are no longer practical utility and make, uh, make provision to connect in connection with the repeal of these enactments. This is the one that causes problems for Australia, except insofar as their, uh, their laws are preserved. Yeah. Yeah. And this is the only way that law can be taken away. Only another order in council from a monarch can repeal the law created by the Pacific Islanders Act of 1875. Queen Elizabeth has to sign another order in council to wipe it out. The Parliament of England can't, the Australian Parliament can't. And here, um, this is the 67 of the Pacific Islands Act, is consistent with the Magna Carta. No free man shall be decised or imprisoned or stripped of his rights or possession or outlawed or exiled or deprived of his standing in any way, nor will we proceed with force against him or send others to do so, except by the lawful judgment of his own equals or by the law of the land. And this is the one that messes them up. That's the one that messes them because up. Because what's the law of the land? Because what's the law of the land? It was common law. <coughs> they've already told you what they that is. They already told us what that is. They've told you in Bon John and the other one. Yes, those other cases. They told us that the law of the land is Aboriginal law and custom. That's the law of Australia. All this other law don't exist as far as Aboriginal people are concerned. Okay. So we'll end there. And... Uh, and we might have some time after the Gilbert Memorial to take it. But Gary's going to be talking on treaty, and after that, if we've got some time, we'll go into other stuff. All right? So thanks, and we'll have all the questions later on this afternoon. So write everything down, all the things that you've learnt, and then we discuss it all after lunch.